God's Word with us here this evening. We're in the book of 1 Samuel, as evidenced by the, uh, the shot behind me. You can see that, so grab a Bible, open up 1 Samuel, and turn to the chapter at number 17. This, uh, this story, which of course is proverbial, David and Goliath will be the story that we take a look at tonight. Uh, I think it was at least three times in the last week, three times that I have heard this phrase, David and Goliath used in the kind of the media or, or the public spectrum in the last two weeks, predominantly in sport. If I'm ever going to watch TV, it's almost always just watching sport. That's about as much TV as I can handle. And they're often with this proverbial phrase, it's a, it's a David versus Goliath contest, so to speak. And of course, the imagery there is that there is clearly an underdog who has really no obvious chance of winning, or at least no apparent chance of winning. And, and there's clearly the, the one who should win by, by any stretch of the imagination can't lose and and so this story we're going to discover together tonight has got so much more to offer, of course, than just a, just a pop culture proverb, but we're going to see this and read this together. It is a long chapter. It's actually, I think, 58 verses long. I took a look at that before and I thought, well, we're going to read this together. We're going to enjoy this. It's God's Word. It's not wasted space. Some preachers would read a verse or two and paraphrase the rest. I'm just, I'm just the kind of preacher that wants to dive into God's Word and read every single word together with you that God would speak to us. And then we're going to share some thoughts around this seminal story, this incredibly well-known story in, in a different regard, not so well-known story, the story of David, the, the pretender to the throne. That's not a knock on David. He's not yet the king, though he's anointed and anticipated to soon be the king. And of course, the current king, Saul, equipping David to go fight the champion of the Philistines, whose name is Goliath. Let's dive into this. We're going to read all these verses together. We're going to pray God's blessing over this, and then we're going to dive into some exposition together. Without further ado, now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle. And gathered at Sokar, which belongs to Judah, they encamped between Sokar and Azekar in Ephes Damin. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. A champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, roughly translated a little over nine feet tall, three meters in the metric system. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. It's about 125 pounds. And he, had a bron and he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son, David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons, and the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him was Abinadab, and the third was Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistines drew near and presented, the Philistine rather, this is Goliath, drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these 10 loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these 10 cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Of course, verse 19 is not implying the battle has begun, but they are in array ready for the battle. 
So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse his father had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper. He ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, There was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter And give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. So David spoke to the man who stood by saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the man, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why have you come down here? And and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard, struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these. For I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand. He chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. Right, that's the worst, isn't it? And the guy that comes out to fight you is better looking than you. David disdains him. Better good-looking in this sense, I, I jest, of course, but simply means he looks like he's taken no scars whatsoever. He hasn't been in a battle at all, as far as Goliath can tell. So verse 43, this is the response. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save by sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose, came and drew near to meet David, 
that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with him with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wound of the Philistine fell along the road of Sha'aram, 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 I'll get it third time, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of his army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before, the, brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. May God bless the reading of his own precious word. Let's pray. God bless this word. We come before you, Father, this evening and we sit at your table to sup at the bounty of your word, Lord God. Jesus truly said that man does not live by bread alone, Father, but every word that proceeds from your mouth. Lord God, use this chapter tonight to challenge us, to encourage us, to enlighten us, and continue to bless us in the mission that Christ has commissioned us. Father, bless this word in Jesus' name. Amen. That's quite a tale indeed. It's no wonder that that story there is one of the favorite stories of all storytelling throughout human history. This story has been retold and modified, and as I said, it's been turned into even a, a metaphor commonly used in society. That is a tremendously wonderful story. David and Goliath. It has received, of course, much praise, and it's received a fair bit of criticism. As we briefly rethink through this story, David, of course, we learned this last week, has already been commissioned by the king to be the minstrel in his court, to, to play of his harp so that Saul's distress can be relieved. But David was only in the court for part of the time, and he had to go back every now and then to help his father with the sheep. And now the battle lines have been drawn between the Philistines and the Israelites. Saul doesn't need a minstrel at this particular point in time. So David finds himself spending most of his time back at home, taking care of sheep. And all of that memory about being the guy playing in the king's court has kind of become forgotten. In fact, Saul seems to have even forgotten not so much who David is. He, he, he recognizes David somewhat, but he just forgets what family David's from and, and why David is who he is. Now, Saul, of course, doesn't know that David has been anointed by the prophet Samuel to succeed him as king. But we know that because we've already seen that in the previous history. David faces Goliath. For 40 days, this Philistine giant comes out and stands there and cries out to the Israelites, give me one man and we will duel and the winner of the duel will be the, will be the victor of the day and, 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 and the losing army shall become servants to the victor. And so Goliath came out for 40 days, twice a day. So 80 times straight. These Israelites had to stand and hear the sledging, the taunting, the trash talking of this giant Goliath. And no doubt many of the Israelites were thinking to themselves, well, Goliath is a giant. He's clearly been a man of war since his youth. He's very adept at battle. The only one that really should go and fight him would obviously be King Saul. We've already read and learned that King Saul was a head and shoulders taller than everybody else in all Israel and all Judah. If there's ever going to be someone that should at least put their hand up to go and fight Goliath, it should be Saul. Saul's nowhere to be found. Saul's hiding away in his tent, timid and afraid. And it takes this boy, this shepherd, 
And you should know that David at this point is somewhere in the vicinity of 15 years of age. He's but a youth. And he comes out and his duty this day is just to bring the, the grilled cheese sandwiches to his brother and the captain of the army. That's all it is. And David happens to be there at one of these 80 sequential times when Goliath comes out and announces his challenge. And David says, I don't even understand what the hesitation is. Is there no one to face this guy? He's mocking the God of Israel. He's mocking us. He's, he's challenging us. Why has no one volunteered? And then David, of course, as a, as a good young man, starts to, starts to lick his lips and salivate over the reward. You get, you get a wife, Saul's daughters become yours. Your whole family becomes, becomes free of any tax. You become enriched with great riches. And David says, surely there is someone in Israel that will fight him. And of course, there's no one. So David goes to Saul and says, now, we read this, but you have to remember he's 15. So you have to read this with the attitude that a 15-year-old would have. So this 15-year-old, yes, David, I know we've all read the Bible, we've learned to revere David, that's true, but at this point, he's a pretty arrogant young man. So he walks into Saul's tent and says, never mind, Saul, don't worry anymore, um, the, the answer has arrived. It's pretty shocking. Saul, in fact, shows a a deal of patience with David. He somewhat recognizes him as someone who's provided some help in the past, and so he's patient with him. The the pluck of this young man. Don't worry, Saul, I've arrived. It's all good. The Savior has come. You can calm down. I will go. Of course, Saul's not convinced. Of course, Saul's not on board. But the circumstance that Saul is faced with, this is the reality. The Philistines outnumber. The Philistines are are, are outnumbered. Outarmed the Israelites. The Israelites cannot win this battle in a face to face confrontation. In fact, the man to man situation is the only real scenario that Israel has to be victorious on this particular battle. But Saul can't find anyone to volunteer. And here comes this 15 year old shepherd who says, Give me a chance. So Saul says, Well, what other option do we have? If you lose, we end up fighting them anyway. And if we fight them, we still lose. So sure, David, here's my, here's my armory. Take my coat of mail and take my sword and, and get ready to go. And David is quite a shorter guy. Some historians say that Saul's probably, and I don't know how they know this exactly, but maybe just for, just for reference sake, Saul's maybe about six foot six, quite a, quite a tall man, especially back in this era. David, maybe he's more like 5'9", 5'10", just kind of an average-sized guy. And David's trying to walk around in this armor, and he complains, I've never tested this. I've, I've never worn this before. This is not my normal attire. If you don't mind, I'd like to just go with some stones and my sling. So David goes, and he faces the giant. The giant, of course, is entirely disgusted. Here comes this 15-year-old boy with his slingshot. So Goliath begins to curse him. And David, in the arrogance and the pluck of youth, which, if you haven't caught on by now, I'm always a fan of, always a fan of, David then says to Goliath, after Goliath threatens David and says, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds, you know, David says, well, here's the deal, Goliath, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds. After I cut your head off with a sword, then I'm going to feed the flesh of all the Philistines to the birds. That wasn't part of the deal, remember? Remember, the deal was, firstly, David doesn't have a sword. So it's a, fairly, it's a fairly plucky threat to make when you're carrying stones. It's hard to sever a head with stones. But secondly, the deal was that if, if David wins, the Philistines were meant to become their servants and slaves. It was meant to be, we take you on as a slave class. But David's having none of it. The Goliath and David interaction lasts but a moment. The sling of a stone, one shot, dead center in the forehead. Goliath falls flat face on the ground. His armor bearer, we don't hear about again. He runs scampering off who knows where. David takes Goliath's sword. The thing must have weighed half a ton. We don't know. Some historians think that Goliath probably weighed about 600 pounds. It's likely. Pulls out this sword and you can imagine this 15-year-old boy trying to heave this thing over his head and he brings it down and severs the head of Goliath. The Israelites see the victory. They're suddenly, they're suddenly filled with this, not just joy, but this rush of motivation and energy. They charge after the Philistines. And they take and plunder all their goods and kill many thousands of them. 
Israel rises and shouts. It's like the winning team, right, of the winning team of the Super Bowl. Against all odds, you know, the underdogs win. But this time, the, the fans of the winning team who are the underdogs, they get to rush on the field and they get to kill as many of the opposition team and supporters as they like. It's a glorious day. It's what every good fan really wants to do. That got really morbid, didn't it? Part of this situation is that the Philistines were the ones that initiated this contractual agreement. Whoever wins the duel, they get to take the other's army as a servant and a slave class. And as soon as Goliath falls, what do the Philistines do? They run from the battlefield back to their homes. That's not the deal. Israel had every right and reason to chase after them and plunder their tents and their stores and kill them by the sword, and they did. The first and the most important, well, maybe not the most important, but one of the preeminent points I think I I, I want to make about this story is this story is historic fact. This really happened. There are a lot of academics and scholars, so-called learners, students of the Bible, that try and find reason why this story is probably not true, or at least grossly embellished. And I don't I don't really understand why. I did some research this week on some of the common ob- objections to this story. One of the main ones is that, well, Goliath is recorded as being just too big. Really. I find that a peculiar one. You know, the, the tallest man that was ever recorded, not the tallest man, but the one that was ever recorded in modern scientific recording methods was a man named Robert Wadlow. He was 8 foot 11.1. He's ranked the tallest human recorded in modern times. What's hard to believe about Goliath being a little over nine foot? What what makes that impossible to believe, that he was slightly taller? It's hard to imagine exactly what the objection is here. It's extremely unusual, and the story presents Goliath as being an extremely unusual person. The second objection that I found, one of the more common ones, was that There's no way, there's just no way that King Saul would have allowed David to go out and battle on behalf of the whole nation. There's just no way. The the objections sound like this. Even if David regaled the king with his stories of killing the bear and killing the lion, Saul would have not been impressed. He would not have even been convinced. This 15-year-old kid, really, you've killed a lion, really, you've, you've killed a bear. These are tall tales for a young boy. The objection is that King Saul would not have allowed David to go. But when we remember that 80 times the challenge has been the challenge has been set before Israel to send them a warrior to fight Goliath, technically it should have been Saul who came forth. I think what we should read in this story is Saul is volunteered that there's anyone else at all. It should have been him. If anyone in Israel should fight the giant, it should be the tallest man in Israel. And, and, and second to that, if anyone in Israel should, should put upon his shoulders the future of the freedom of the citizens of Israel, it should be the king. I think when David sauntered into Saul's tent, I think Saul was relieved. I mean, Saul was certain that David was going to be slaughtered, but maybe he thought it, had, it would buy him some time to think of another strategy. We don't know exactly what was going on in Saul's head. But this is not an objection to the historicity of the story. This is a true historic account. And one of those biblical stories that has a mountain of personal application for all of us. The story is so, this story is so overdone, overused, overreferenced. You've been in church long enough to have heard sermons on this and illustrations on this and Sunday school lessons on this. This is, this is an overused story, to be sure. But the predictable applications these days seem to be a little out of fashion. As I did some research on the story and how people were applying it to people's lives, I noted that many today are seeking a novel take, like a novel, a novel way of looking at it. How do, we, how do we find the nuance in this story that no one has ever seen before? I was shocked to learn that many people today have abandoned traditional approaches to the application. But I must admit that the traditional applications of this story still hold true and still to me seem to be the most helpful. We do face insurmountable odds in our life. There are occasions 
in our life where we are faced with an obstacle, a challenge of some shape or form that seems well beyond any reasonable odds of our victory. We face these in our life and we know that God must be the source of our victory. And so we need to be Davidic. In other words, King David, well, he's not king yet. Excuse me for making that mistake. But soon to be King David in this story shows us how we should act in light of circumstances that we face that are giants opposing us. We should be more Davidic in the way we undervalue outward obstacles and the way we highly value God's presence and power to help us overcome. That's the source of David's strength. The great offense of King David, again, same mistake. You're going to forgive me every time I say it. The great mistake of the shepherd boy David, the great offense of his heart, is that this Philistine is mocking the Lord of hosts, the God of armies, Jehovah, Sabaoth, the great and mighty God of Israel. David realizes it's in the strength of the Lord that he would be victorious. So we need a godly confidence. Stories like this in Scripture should be for us an infusion of godly confidence. No matter how big the giant is that you face, the God that is within you is always greater. Like David, we need this confidence to charge toward our obstacle and take them head on as David does. I remember having studied this story many times in the past. I've preached sermons from this and That sentence to me is always the most staggering of the whole chapter. When David runs toward the giant, I don't know why he's not creeping, hiding behind rocks, slowly navigating his entrance into the battle. He knows the God that is with him, the God that is behind him, the God that will empower his victory. We ought to believe that all things are possible for those who believe God. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. And so we should follow David's example as a whole. It won't surprise you to learn that Charles Spurgeon, the great great Baptist preacher of the 19th century, preached a sermon on this chapter. No one's surprised by that. His sermon had a whole bunch of application points. I've I've stolen a few of them. I want to share them with you tonight. These are credit where credit's due. I've reworded them, but these are essentially plucked from the sermon from Charles Spurgeon. The first one, be anointed with the Spirit. It's like David was anointed with the oil out of the horn of Samuel. We must pursue the anointing of the Spirit if we're to be victorious over our giants. Let me read you Charles Spurgeon's sentence on this. He says, Unless the Spirit of God is upon us, we have no might from within and no means from without to rely upon. We wait upon the Lord. Beloved, we seek strength from Him alone. Therefore, we are victorious. There cannot come out of you what has not been put inside you. This is a tremendous challenge to us. Too many times in our life, we read stories like David and Goliath. We assume that they, of course, are stories that that we should imbibe and take on and apply to our life. And then we go charging at giants, get knocked flat on our face and wonder what happened. We must understand that David's faith, his confidence comes from his anointing. Not just the anointing of Samuel, but the anointing of the Spirit. Remember we read this in our previous chapter that when Samuel anointed him with oil, the Spirit of God came upon David. We need the Spirit. We need the Spirit. Jesus did not commence his own public ministry until he had the Spirit's anointing. And even his apostles were told, tarry in Jerusalem and await the anointing of the Spirit. Don't underestimate the necessity of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let me read this line again as Charles Spurgeon shared. It says, There cannot come out of you what has not been put into you. Christians love to quote the text in Ephesians. That God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. But they rarely remember the following line. According to the power at work in you. It's not an open license to charge at any giant that you see lying around challenging the Lord God. Until you have the anointing, prayed for God, sought God's grace, spent time alone with God, that your devotional life 
is disciplined and on track. It's an important point. The next point, again, shamelessly stolen from a greater preacher than I. And I've reworded it, but this is essentially the point of Spurgeon. He says, be ready for whatever special service the Lord will bring by being busy in the day-to-day service of the Lord. I love this point. This may seem a little more complex at first, but it really is quite simple. Here's, Here's the point. If David... If David had not come to the battlefront with with the grilled cheese sandwiches, he would not have destroyed the giant and gained the victory for the entire nation. Too many Christians, too many Christians are waiting around for the big break, the big opportunity to kill giants and make a name for himself. Somebody needs to carry the sandwich platter. And a sandwich platter carrying servant is often the humble giant killing warrior that God ordained. Spurgeon's point is very, very helpful, especially in our day and age where celebrity Christianity is out of control. People worship these celebrity Christians, and everyone worships them with with an eye of envy. Why, Why can't I be that? Why can't I be lauded and praised and made much of? We have to come back and realize this point, that David's job that day was to carry a platter of sandwiches. And in that day-to-day basic duty, we would call it maybe a mundane, ordinary duty of the church, God raised him up to be the giant killer. And that's where God plucks his giant killers from. I have in my time as being a preacher and a pastor seen far too many Christians who warm up pews and sit back pouting that they haven't been utilized as they should be, but they won't pick up a mop or a broom. They won't push a lawnmower. Don't you know that their gifts, their gifts are too great for that? No, it is the humble servants that God raises up to slaughter giants. This next one, be prepared to follow your heart And sometimes, ignore those who seem to know better. I love this. I love this point. I love that this was Spurgeon's point. Now, you can imagine the 16-year-old Charles Spurgeon enters his first pastorate preaching, comes down to London at 19, pastors the great New Park Street Chapel. The church is in steep decline. It once was pastored by by the theological greats like the, the great John Gill. No one here knows the name John Gill. He was a great in his time, in his era. He's still a man that people read and reference today. But now this new Park Street Chapel had come into steep decline. And Charles Spurgeon arrives as a teenager trusting in God. He talks about Spurgeon. talks about when he first arrived, he, he wore this country bunkum, kind of this, this, this rube suit from the country that his mum sewed together. And he had the accent of a, of a real out-in-the-sticks country kid. And everyone in London mocked him, laughed at him. But with the grace and the power of God, he stood where God had called him and brought salvation to tens and tens and tens of thousands of people. Be prepared to follow your heart. And sometimes, please put the emphasis on that word, sometimes, ignore those who seem to know better. Now, this is a controversial point, but a necessary one. What would have come of David and the Israelites if David had heeded the rebuke of his brothers, right? His older brothers. What are you doing down here, punk kid? Who'd you leave those sheep with? I know you. You just want to sit off the sideline and watch the battle. You're just here to watch a fight. That's all you want. Those of us with brothers, older or younger, we can see some truth in those words. David retorts with, is there not a cause? I can assure you, let me just speak personally, I can assure you the vast majority of victories that the Lord has wrought in my personal life, I'm not here to aggrandize or retell the tales, but they were battles that I entered into against the advice of those who feigned to know better than me. And by God's grace, by God's grace, I now have many testimonies, and I trust you do as well, that I would never have had if I stopped and waited for permission from those that knew better. 
Let me read you the words of Spurgeon. He says this, Great deference is due to the judgment of our seniors. Period. Great deference is due to the judgment of our seniors. Know that. Live that. But, Spurgeon goes on, greater respect is due to the motions of the Spirit of God within our hearts. And there are some times that we will be called to some task or some ministry or area of service that others will tell us, you have no right to that. It's not the right time for that. Don't do that. Your motives are wrong in engaging in that. And you need to follow the Spirit's leading and sometimes ignore the advice of those who seem to know better. The advice of those who seek the best for you is not to be ignored. But you must obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. The next point, this will be our last point of application before I entirely, before I lose my voice today. Don't be unnecessarily encumbered by what others think you need. This, of course, comes from that, that comedic situation where Saul tries to make David wear his armor. Don't be unnecessarily encumbered by what others think you need. Saul's armor was foisted upon David, and David knew it would be harmful, not helpful. It would be a hindrance, not a benefit. If you go with the bare essentials that God has given you, and if your trust is in the Lord, that the battle is the Lord's, and in the very words of David, he says, the Lord can save by sword or spear or even just a stone. The battle belongs to the Lord. Then, of course, God will grant the victory if you're obedient and you just go. If you sit by and wait, if you sit back and wait, if you're negligent and wait, if you're apathetic and wait because you think you need more equipping, more education, more equipment, the problem is the battle will not be yours. Identify your giant and remember the words of David. Is there not a cause? The battle is the Lord's. Let's close with a gospel reflection on this because, of course, as I'd said this some weeks ago, there are certain stories in the book of 1 Samuel where the gospel is really clearly pressing upon us. There are other stories where it's more implicit. And this is one of those accounts where the gospel is very, very clear. One commentator wrote this. Representative warfare effected by means of a contest of champions. It was common in the ancient world. You know, people in the ancient world believed, it's not so common in our modern world, unfortunately, The people in the ancient world just genuinely believed that whoever was the victor in a battle were the ones that God decreed should win. And so because people believed that, the Philistines believed that their gods were greater than Jehovah of Israel. Israel, knowing full well that their God is the only true God, believed that their God would bring the victory. This is why armies would face each other, to prove whose God was the greatest. And so it made sense in that mindset that you can just as easily elect a combatant from your side and the opponents would elect a combatant from their side, and the two combatants can go at it, and the God who is true can still demonstrate His supremacy. This was not uncommon in the ancient world. And it saved the death of thousands of, army, of, of, of military men from these two armies. So we think about this form of representative battle. Representative Warfare, effected by the means of a contest among champions. And here in this story, we have Goliath, and he represents false gods. He represents the, the Philistines. And we have David, who represents the shepherd of Israel. Now, the way this is clearly gospel is this is exactly how God redeems us from our sin. The truth of the matter is all of us have sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. All of us are guilty before God. And all of us stand rightly under the death sentence of the law. We've all sinned. 
And the wages of sin is death. And heaven sends forth its champion. Heaven sends forth another shepherd of Israel. This Lord Jesus Christ, who won't just wage warfare on behalf of himself, but on behalf of all of those that he represents. It is, on the one hand, the giant of sin's depravity versus the man of valor. On the one hand, the king of terrors versus the son of man. On one hand, it's the the last enemy. And on the other hand, it's the last Adam. All of these are titles taken from your Bible that refer to the enemy of enslavement to sin and death and Jesus the victor and the champion. So Charles Spurgeon wrote this. Now this is convoluted. Let me just preface this quote. What's convoluted about this quote is what I wanted out of this. Let me just let me just pull the curtain back and give you a look at some of my prep here. There's an Augustine, St. Augustine quote in here that I really wanted to use. And Spurgeon uses it, but never clarifies when Augustine starts speaking and when Spurgeon starts speaking. So I just had to copy and paste the whole thing, and hopefully it made some sense when I read it. But this is exactly the way we see the gospel bearing forth in this story. And particularly, before we read it, in light of the fact that David takes Goliath's sword to kill the giant. Remember, Spurgeon commences, remember that David cut off Goliath's head with his own sword. Augustine, in his comment on this passage, very well brings out the thought that the triumph of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is here set forth in the history of David. He, through death, Jesus, remember, through death, destroyed him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. He That's death, died at the hands of death. To put it succinctly, he death by dying slew. Cut off the giant's head with his own sword. The cross that was meant to be the death of the Savior ended up being the death of sin. The crucifixion of Jesus, which was supposed to be the victory of Satan, was the consummate victory of Jesus over Satan, sin, and death. We see this very clearly encapsulated in the story of David and Goliath. The true champion is Jesus. Yes, we've all sinned. Yes, we're all prone to die the death of hell because we're guilty of sin. But yes, Jesus came and he had no sin. And when he hung on that cross... The worst thing that Satan could do would allow him to die because when Jesus died, he robbed death of its power because that is an illegitimate death. Jesus with no sin, holy, harmless, undefiled, had no curse of sin over him. And when Satan began to salivate and lick his lips and say, I'm going to kill this God man, I'm going to destroy him, Satan made the greatest mistake of all. He illegitimately killed the author of life. And this Jesus Christ, though crucified, in his resurrection, he triumphs. He takes the power of sin and death. He conquers Satan and liberates us. From the curse of the law. If we trust in him. We better pray before I entirely lose my voice. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me here this evening. Father God we thank you for this gospel. Thank you for this story David and Goliath. Father it's a wonderful story. It's a privilege to read it. To teach it. To be remembered of it. But Father help us with the eye of faith to see Christ. And to know that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the great victor, the champion. He has secured for us our salvation in His gracious dying, in His victorious rising. Help us to be found in Him by placing our trust in this good and glorious gospel. We ask your blessing upon this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.